Welcome to DivCasts from University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch. And I hope the second session today will be just as nice as the first one and just as engaging and interesting. Our first speaker uh, for this second section is Professor Marla Segol. Marla comes to us from the University of Buffalo, where she holds the professorship in Jewish studies uh, at the associate level in the Department of Transnational Studies and at the Institute for Jewish Thought and Heritage. Professor Segol works mainly in the field of Kabbalah and the history of the body in religion, a fascinating topic. Segol has published widely in Jewish and religious studies, and her work is well known to everybody who is working on mysticism, especially early Jewish mysticism and medieval. Uh, uh, Professor Segol's books include Word and Image in Medieval Kabbalah, Religious Conversion, History and Genre in Fleur de Blanchefort, Aucassin and Nicolette, and Flamenca, and Sexuality and Cosmology in Medieval Literary Text, a book that she has co-edited with Jennifer Brown. Her current book project is titled Kabbalah's Two Body, and it is in progress and will be published by Pennsylvania State Press. Professor Segol will be speaking to us today about astrology, medicine, microcosm, and magic, the mechanics of theology in the Shi'ur Koma, the Sefer Yetzirah, and the interpreters. Welcome, Professor Segol. That was a really nice introduction. Thank you. <laughs> so, ooh, what happened here? What? Okay, here we go. Um, I'm going to start out with a confession. You ready? I've deceived you. And I'm not going to talk about the Shir Koma. But I hope to distract you with a lot of other things. So let's move on, shall we? <laughs> um, one of the main foci of early Arabic astrology is to theorize the relation between the microcosm and the macrocosm in order to better understand how to operate on it. Islamic astrology is by nature both cosmopolitan and particularistic, drawing on a wide range of traditions to formul formulate models specifically their own, suited their time, place, concerns, and commitments. Just as the early Islamic works do, um, early Hebrew astrological works also strive to understand the relation between microcosm and macrocosm. And like them, they operate syncretistically, combining other astrological discourses to formulate models that accord with their own sensibilities, which they then claim as their own tradition. Um, the works considered use this knowledge for healing, to show divine power, and to exercise it. In short, all the works we'll talk about today use astrology for medicine, miracle, and magic, which, which might seem distinct to us, but was only sometimes so for them. In this paper, I'll explore the conflation and the distinction of these categories in Jewish works using astrological models before and after the advent of Islamic astrology. Today, I'll examine two pre-Islamic, late antique Jewish works, and then I'll compare them to two 10th century works claiming knowledge of Arabic astrology. The pre-Islamic primary texts include Sefer Asaf, a Hebrew compilation of medical lectures probably composed in 6th century Persia, and the Sefer Yetzirah, again, probably, composed between the 5th and 7th centuries. The 10th century commentaries include the Babylonian Sadia Gaon's commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah, written in Judeo-Arabic in 931, and the Byzantine Shabbatai Donalo's Sefer Chachmoni, written in Hebrew in 946. These texts are linked in a variety of ways. The Sefer Asaf, named for its composer, is a medical compilation that relies on some of the same sources used by later Jewish and Muslim writers alike. The 5th to 7th century Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, is often labeled the first work of Jewish science. Of course, that depends on your definition of science. Um, <laughs> But it does systematically narrate a cosmogony and a cosmology, employing astrological models for practical purposes. 
The next work, Sadia Gaon's 931 commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah, reinterprets the book to accord with his own Kalamist views, drawing upon the theology of the Kalam movement current in 10th century Babylonia, with its first murmurings of criticism for astrology. Finally, Shabbatai Donalo's 946 Sefer Chachmoni is a Byzantine commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah that draws both upon Arabic astrology and upon the medical models articulated in Sefer Asaf. So we're going to start with Sefer Asaf. It's a huge book, generically diverse and structurally complex. Munich 231, considered the most complete manuscript, has 276 folios and one half. It was probably composed, not the manuscript, but the book, um, in about sixth century in the southwest corner of Persia in Junda Shakur. It contains several parts. An introduction reciting the genealogy of medicine up to and including the present author, a series of lectures beginning with an account of the human being as a microcosm, a doctor's oath for graduating students, a pharmacopoeia based on Dioscorides' um, Materia Medica, um, translated into Arabic in the ninth century, and a book of formulas and antidotes. The work ends with a paraphr paraphrase of Hippocrates' aphorisms and prognosticon, which was among the first um, group of Greek books translated into Arabic in the year 750 to 850. The parts of the work most relevant to our purposes today are the introduction with its genealogy of medicine and its description of the human body as a microcosm, along with the doctor's oath for graduating students. Its view of medicine is complex. On the one hand, it brings many different materials together because of the cosmopolitan university milieu in which it was composed and used. And on the other, it expresses a particularistic view of medicine as miracle, using technology and culturally specific rituals uh, and narratives to ethically exercise sacred power. According to it, the transformation of the human body from sick to well was proof of divine glory, and the virtuous physician was its agent. In citing his sources, Asaf includes a wide range of traditions, beginning with, the Jewish, beginning with the Jewish tradition and ending with a cosmopolitan model to account for its transmission. First, he believes that illness is a result of human sin, but that medical knowledge was nonetheless transmitted directly from God to the angel Raphael and from there to the biblical figure of Noah. And I'm going to quote the text. The angel told Noah, the remedies for the afflictions of humankind and all kinds of remedies for healing with trees of the earth and plants of the soil and their roots. At the same time, once that particularistic knowledge is acquired, it is widely disseminated among different cultures, independently theorized among them, and reassembled. Here I quote at length, if not in full. Noah wrote all these things in a book and gave it to Shem, his oldest son. And the ancient sages copied from this book and wrote many books, each one in his own language. Knowledge about medicine increased on the earth among all the nations who examined the books of, the books of remedies, particularly among the sages of India, Macedonia, and Egypt. For the sages of India traveled about um, in quest of every kind of medicinal tree and spice. And the sages of Aram discovered the medicinal properties of all the different kinds of plants and their seeds, and they translated into Aramaic an explanation um, for the contents of the books. So each of these groups developed different aspects of the book, such as the Egyptians, who began to use magical charms and to divine future events with constellations and with stars. Thus, we see a culturally specific narrative of medical knowledge as divine revelation to redeem people from punishments for sin, um, but at the same time, um, healing acts on a cosmopolitan model of astrology. Astrological knowledge from other traditions serves as the basis of, me of medical practice as it's described in the book. And yet, of course, it's also reconciled with Jewish doctrine. The author's brief reinterpretation of the microcosm also renders a Galenic discourse Judaic when the writer says, the wise physicians have indeed said that the body was created from four things, cold, hot, wet, and dry, paralleling the four divisions of the first creation, that is, water, fire, air, and earth. The body was also created from four things, that is, blood, phlegm, red bile, and black bile. He spoke further, and they're talking about Asaf, he spoke further of the four spirits, 
which govern the body apart from the spirit of life. For man's creation is like the creation of day and night, and of the summer and the winter. All these, with their times, periods, minutes, and reckoning, are governed by the four spirits. So this is to say that the author first situates the human body in a Galenic microcosm, and then biblicizes it by arguing that its four-element composition is directly parallel to divine creation, as it's narrated in Genesis 1, with a little bit of massaging. Uh, for this for this one, details the creation of water, fire, and earth with air, or ruach, preceding them all. The point, though, is that the human body is made of the same elements as the divinely created cosmos, the narrative, narrative of which is derived from the Hebrew Bible, developed by others, and reinterpreted according to it. So doctors act upon this astrological model in the process of healing, here conceived as revelation of divine power. As such, it's a sort of miracle, which is um, clear, it's made clear in the doctor's oath section of the text. So, Asaf pre prevents medicine as miracle, demonstrating divine glory to the nation, so as he says, they will abandon their idols and images and will desire to worship God like you. Consistent with the idea of medicine as miracle, Asaf views healing as the legitimate use of real divine power to convert others and convince them to abandon other forms of worship. Asaf argues that God, and I quote, causes curative plants to grow, puts sagacity in the hearts of the wise in order that they should heal through the abundance of his loving kindness and that they should recount wonders in the congregation of many so that every living being knows that he made him and that there is no savior other than he. Mm. That's it, that's all. You should be converted now. Um, <laughs> so in this passage, um, healing shows the correct exercise of legitimate power as spectacle. Physicians are even commanded to recount wonders in the congregation of many, much as human beings are commanded to teach Torah to each generation. Even more, medicine's conversionary, for when people are healed, the nations will abandon their idols and images and desire to worship God like you. Thus, the practice of medicine is a form of a virtue ethic in which the physician provides the model for good character and healing, which also consists in the proper exercise of legitimate power gained by acting on the astrologically conceived macrocosm. Here we understand medicine as a miracle. Ooh, ooh, my pages are out of order. I don't know how that happened, but let's see. Mm, yeah, here we go. Six. I'm really sorry. Uh, here we go. Through which the physician shows divine glory. In the, so this is the, the physician showing divine glory, and that constitutes the exercise of divine power. And since it is the exercise of divine power, it's also a form of theurgy. Um, so now we're going to talk about the Sefer Yitzhak. The Sefer Yitzhak, the Book of Formation, was probably written between the 5th and 7th centuries, possibly Byzantine, though if you try to get a scholarly consensus on this, um, you would be sadly frustrated. Um, <laughs> so the work is short, from 1,300 to 2,737 words, depending on the version and on the manuscript. It's cryptic. It's written in very simple Hebrew. And as such, it has generated an impressively large body of commentary. It narrates the creation of the world within, with the 10 spherot, undefined in the work, and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, further broken down into three groups consisting of three mother letters, Aleph Memshin, um, seven double letters, um, Bet Gimel, Dalid, Kaf, Pe, Resh, Taf, and 12 simple letters corresponding to the key ast astrological groupings, such as the seven planets and the 12 constellations, plus three categories of existence, which it calls the universe, the year, and the soul, the constellations, the planets, and the human being. Thus, as much as it a it's a cosmogonic text, it is also a cosmological text based in astrology. One of its primary aims, then, is to theorize the relation between the microcosm and the macrocosm, and to activate that knowledge in theurgic ritual practice. Both of these elements, astrology and theurgic ritual, are addressed at length by its medieval commentators, but little studied by contemporary scholars. Theurgy, yes, but astronomy, not as much. Um, 
The Sefer Yitzhira understands the relation between macrocosm and microcosm as mediated by the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's a letterism. Um, Sefer Yitzhira 1, the first verse, narrates the divine creation of the letters along with the spherot. They are chakak yah, with these two words respectively translated as carved out and God. Uh, but the text is really ambivalent about their nature, and it doesn't say whether they're carved out by God or carved out of God. Their properties vary according to the translation of chakak yah. If they're carved out by God, then the, letters are, um, the letter forms are divine artifacts. They are objects made by God that therefore possess some residue of divine power. If the letters are carved out of God, they are nothing short of divine substance. Either way, they have a direct connection to the divine, to the cosmos as a whole, and to the human body specifically. This alters an earlier melotheistic model um, common in the work of um, Ptolemy, Hippocrates, and Galen, reflecting uh, an astrological doctrine relating the parts of the heavens, the planets, or the signs of the zodiac directly to the parts of the human body. According to this model, the parts, are related, to, the parts related to one another were simultaneously present in each other, each substantively linked to the other. In the Sefer Yetzirah, the Hebrew letter forms provide that substantial link between them. So the, the Sefer Yetzirah's discussion of Aleph, one of the three mother letters, shows the creation of the three categories of existence, the three related categories of existence. And I'm quoting um, verse 32. He made Aleph rule over air and bound it to a crown and combined them with each other and formed with them air in the universe, the temperate in the year, and the chest in the body. The astrological aspects of the Sefer Yetzirah are even clearer in its discussion of the seven double and the 12 simple letters. Seven double letters, he carved them, he hewed them, combined them, weighed them, and exchanged them. And with them, he formed the planets in the universe, the days in the year, and the apertures in ma mankind by seven, so it's like the openings of the body. The seven, the seven double sections ends with this summary. There is one with bet these, the letter bet. Saturn, the Sabbath, the mouth, life and death. There was formed with Gimel these. Jupiter, the first day of the week, the right eye, peace and evil. There was formed with Dalit these. Mars, the second day of the week, the left eye, wisdom and folly, and so on. Okay? Um, in, these, in this, each of the seven letters corresponds with a planet or a constellation, a part of the human body, and a possible human fate or disposition. Together, they participate in the divine force that created all of them. The same formula is applied to each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. If the symbols are rightly used, they reveal a creative power that comes directly from the divine. In the text, it's clear that the letter form is an instrument of divine creation. It's also intended for human use. The text explicitly instructs its readers to manipulate the letters for creative purposes. This action is salvific. This call to action is evident in recurring phrases within the text, um, which requires action throughout. Um, verse 4 directs the reader to get the thing clearly worked out and restore the creator to his place. Other passages, including verses 6 and 24, instruct the reader to know, ponder, and form, moving from passive abstract know to the more active ponder and from there to the material, active, the, the material active form, denoting concrete action. Verse 61 narrates the application of the no ponder and form instructions, showing how the biblical figure of Abraham succeeded in using it. And the text reads, when Abraham our father came, looked, saw, and in investigated, and understood, and carved, and combined, and hewed, and pondered, and succeeded, the Lord of all was revealed to him. And he made him sit in his lap, and he kissed him upon his head. That worked. <laughs> um, Abraham's success culminates in a divine kiss. The creator is restored to his place, and Abraham achieves a union with God. This is a sort of salvation, a making whole. Wholeness is restored on two levels. Divine order is reinstated as the creator is returned to his base. And human and divine are reunited through the ritual of manipulating letters, linking microcosm to macrocosm and acting upon it. 
At the same time, the power of the letters is embedded in astrological forces so that they link God, people, and the stars. So now I'm going to move to um, Sadia's commentary, Sadia Gaon. Um, Sadia Gaon, um, who, lived in, who lived from 882 to 942 in Babylonia, wrote the first surviving complete commentary on the Sefer Yitzhira. Some scholars have argued that the main goal of Sadia's commentary is to delimit the magical powers of the letters, and in this, the theurgic function of the text. This is certainly true, in my opinion. Um, but more specifically, um, Sadia uses contemporary Muslim Kalamist theology to reconcile the book with the creation narrative of Genesis and to position the text within contemporary debates on the merit of astrology. The Jewish, the Jewish Kalam resembled the Muslim. They both argued first that empirical observation and scripture are reconcilable, that the contemplation of the world reveals its creative nature, and hence the existence of the creator. They also believed that the world was created from nothing rather than from pre-existent pre matter. Accordingly, the creator must be of an intrinsically different nature than its creation. And as the world contains plurality, the creator must be of an absolute unity. Absolute divine unity is key to Kalama's thought and to Sadia's. And for Sadia, divine unity is threatened by the theurgic power of the letter forms and by astrology. Sadia reinterprets the Sefer Yitzhira because this important text depicts a cosmos in which Hebrew letter forms are part of the divine and the created world. They substantially unify microcosm with macrocosm. This runs counter to Kalamist ideals in several ways. First, it counters the creation of creation from nothing. Second, if the divine and the created world actually do share a substance via the Hebrew letter forms, it contradicts the notion that the creator must be of a different nature than creation. Finally, the sort of radical imminence communicated by the worldview of the Sefer Yitzirah, that human beings can experience the divine in the world via creation, and that they can imitate the divine by manipulating letter forms, and even more, that God can be summoned by human imitation of that process, these pose a real threat to the absolute unity of the divine, according to Kalam. Thus, Sadia has his work cut out for him, which is to reinterpret the Sefer Yitzirah so that it agrees with his worldview. He uses the following strategies to counter this worldview. First, he tries to reconcile the creation narrative of the Sefer Yitzirah with that in, Gen in Genesis, to distance the Hebrew letter forms from the divine body. Second, he mediates the astrological content by deanimating the cosmos. Third, he mitigates the authority of the figure of Abraham, specifically denaturing his power to perform theurgy. Collectively, these strategies reimagine the relation of the microcosm to the macrocosm and the relation of the, cre uh, the creator to creation. Consistent with his, with his theology, um, which argues that empirical observation and sacred scripture always agree, Sadia works to reconcile the Sefer Yetzirah with the creation narrative of Genesis. He begins the process by listing nine different cosmogonies common in his day, which he says are common in his day. They follow. First, there was no beginning. Second, the universe was created with tiny particles. Third, the creation should not be contemplated as it is beyond human understanding. Four, the universe was created out of water. Five, it was created with air. Six, it was created with fire. Seven, it was fashioned through numbers alone. Um, eight, it was created through numbers and letters in air, which Sadia attributes to the author, the author of the Sefer Yitzhirah. And finally, nine, God created the universe from nothing and all at once. Um, the ninth theory he attributes to the Torah. But if you look at these, beginning with three, um, the Sefer Yitzhirah makes an argument for all of these but the ninth. So first, Parts of it argue that we shouldn't contemplate, we shouldn't contemplate what, it, what it's talking about. It says, if your mind races, return to the place, and for, from there, go out and calculate what the mind cannot grasp. Next, um, it asserts that the cosmos was made sequen sequentially from water, air, and fire, then with numbers, and then with numbers and letters, and with divine breath. Sadia structures his commentary so that each theory from three to eight can be subsumed into the next until you finally arrive at number nine. Um, 
And again, note that number eight summarizes the views of the Sefer Yetzirah. His comments follow. The eighth system belongs to the one who posits a creation, but attributes the origin of things to numbers and letters. These are the words of the author of this book. He attributes the beginning of the creator's creation to 32 things, the 10 numbers and the 22 letters. He does not say, however, that they are abstract and separate. He only says that God created the air and has established the 32 things in it. The numbers, according to him, belong to the air, which is composed of separate particles. When the air current passes these straight and curved pathways, it forms shapes. That's his explanation of the theory of the Sefer Yetzirah. And this is, so this strategy allows Sadia to integrate the Sefer Yetzirah into his interpretation of Genesis 1, represented by number 9, in which the world was created from nothing by divine speech, which created air, and then the numbers and letters described in the Sefer Yetzirah. In this way, he asserts that divine speech precedes the creation of the letters, and that the letters are agents of divine speech rather than the divine body, which reestablishes the primacy of the divine voice as it appears in Genesis. Astrology poses a similar, you know, a similar threat to Kalamist thought generally. Starting in the 9th century, Muslim religious scholars began to cast doubt on the religious acceptability of astrology, and by the 11th, they were seriously questioning its metaphysical assumptions. Like the letters of the Sefer Yitzirah, it was incompatible with, in, incompatible with the concept of God's absolute unity. To that end, Sadia also works to me, mediate the agency of the stars and the planets to which the letters are attached. This is especially evident in his treatment of the Tzli, or the dragon, the astrological entity thought to control the other um, constellations, as discussed in Sefer Yitzhira 54 to 55. Um, and this is the, the section that discusses it. There's a law of 10, 3, 7, and 12. They are commanded in the Tzli, the celestial sphere, and the heart. The Tzli in the universe is like a king on his throne. The celestial sphere in the year is like a king in his province. The heart in mankind is like a king in war. The text shows an astrologically influenced worldview in its discussion of the Tli, which holds real power, determining the course of events. Sadia reads this passage quite differently, however. He writes, I understand this to be a place where two orbits intersect. It's not a constellation resembling a dragon or any other creature. Thus, the Tli possesses neither image nor power. It's merely, in contradistinction to the one presented in the Sefer Yitzirah, a human-identified set of coordinates on a map of the skies. Um, Sadia describes the Tli in contemporary astro astronomical terms, but his proof text here is Job 26.13, which reads, By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked ser serpent. Thus, true to Kalamist ideals, uh, Revelation provides the basis for textual and even scientific interpretation. The Tzli does not exercise the power granted it in the text of the Sefer Yitzirah. Finally, he intervenes in the theurgic capacity of the letters by presenting an imaginal interpretation of um, Sefer Yitzirah 61, which narrates Abraham's combination of the letter forms culminating in a divine embrace. The Sefer Yitzhirah asserts that, it was the, that the text itself was authored by Abraham, who successfully creates by means of the letters. But Sadia writes, we say that the ancients told that this book was authored by Abraham. Note the suspicion. Um, as it says at the end of the book, when Abraham understood, God was revealed to him. But they didn't say that Abraham established the words of the book in this order. Rather, they only said that he conceived of these subjects in his mind and that it became clear to him that the numbers and the letters were the beginning of things, as we shall explain, and that he taught them to the monotheists who were there with him. So, in Sadia's mind, the passage explains that it's not the divine that was revealed to Abraham, but knowledge of the creation process. This renders theurgy imaginal, as there's no encounter. Finally, it treats the transmission of the Sefer Yitzirah as an extension of the narrative of creation from nothing and as a long-standing traditional supplement to the Hebrew Bible. So I'm going to skip a paragraph and go right on to the next part. Um, now we're going to talk about Shabbatai Donalo. 
Um, Shabbatai Donalo's Sefer Chachmoni, a commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah, was written in 946 in Byzantine Italy. The text consists of three main sections, an autobiographical introduction, a commentary on Genesis 126, and a commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah. I mean, they're all considered a commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah, but one of them is a line by line. Um, Shabbatai asserts in his introduction to the work that it was composed after lengthy study of astrology. Um, so it was composed after lengthy study of astrology and under the tutelage of one Baghdad, a Babylonian who was, in his words, not a Jew, and in ours, probably Muslim. We don't know this, however. We only know that he came from Babylonia, where a famous astrologer of the 10th century would be exposed to Arabic astrology, regardless of inclination. Some argue that while the Sefer Yitzirah is only peripherally um, concerned with astrology, Shabbatai's work is nearly exclusively concerned with it, pursuing a different agenda. In my opinion, Donalo's interpretation adds to the text in a manner consistent with its literal meaning. This is to say that like the author of the Sefer Yetzirah, he sees the macrocosm and the microcosm connected by means of the Hebrew letter forms. Like the Sefer Yetzirah too, he sees knowledge of the cosmos as a means of better understanding its maker, a theosophical goal. So too, he sees the ritual practice of letter combination as part of that theosophical goal, elaborating on the instructions already provided in the Sefer Yetzirah with charts and detailed instructions. And while he does not say much about the theurgic power of the letter combination ritual, he doesn't gainsay it either. Uh, instead, Shabbatai uses Islamic astrology and other earlier models to enhance the meaning of letter combination rituals, the letter combination ritual, and to particularize the theosophical knowledge expressed in the Sefer Yetzirah. Shabbatai makes two claims regarding the efficacy of astrology. First, that it was effective for Bag Baghdad, and second, that because it because it derives from Jewish wisdom, it holds apotropaic and salvific power for Jews. Interestingly, though, its efficacy is first legitimated by Baghdad, the Gentile. Shabbatai rests his claim for the efficacy of astrology on the financial success of his teacher. Hey, it worked for him, right? So he says, by the, he says, by the calculation of the planets, the tli, and the constellations, he, Baghdad, was able to speak about things that had already happened and that would happen. And in return for a considerable sum of money and lavish gifts, I had him teach me the discipline of the planets and the calculation of the constellations. The wisdom conveyed by Baghdad was apotropaic and salvific. And so, and Donalo continues, for while wisdom shelters, just as money shelters, the advantage of acquiring wisdom is that it preserves the life of those who possess it, according to the word of the Lord who gives wisdom. In this way, the reading of the stars is a theosophic endeavor. It is also the reading of their divine creator. Finally, coming full circle, Shabbatai argues that, um, that Baghdad's wisdom agreed entirely with the Baraita of Samuel, a Jewish source, as well as with all the Jewish books and all the books of the Greeks and the Macedonians. Yet, the wisdom of that Gentile was very clear and lucid, um, which is not something he says of the Jewish sources. <laughs> um, so recourse to other traditions in Shabbatai's book reconstitutes the lost Jewish one, clouded by time and long-windedness. Um, even more, this wisdom is positioned as the exclusive domain of the Jews. For Donalo, the study of astrology is commanded as a form of divine praise incumbent upon Jews in particular and demonstrating divine glory exemplified in the ability to foretell the future. He asks, what other nation is permitted and able to, to foretell the signs of the future and coming events as Israel, my people, to whom I gave permission to investigate and search for the explanations and who proclaim my uniqueness and testify that I am God? Thus, the obligation is specific to Israel, and the ability to foretell the future attests to the covenant between God and Israel. This is tied directly to the capacity to understand divine workings and to proclaim them. It is miracle, as in Asaf's work, and it attests to the covenantal relationship between God and Israel. 
Shabbatai is sympathetic to the theory of the relation between the microcosm and the macrocosm as, as it's articulated in the Sefer Yitzhira. To re re recapitulate, it employs a melotheistic model in which parts of the heavens, the planets, or the signs of the zodiac are substantively related to the parts of the human body and simultaneously present in each other through the medium of the Hebrew letter forms. In this way, the divine and material are related through the shared letter form. Donnell's commentary adds to this theory when he supplies more details to assert that language is an instantiation of divine indwelling. This is a little tricky because it's, he's merged his comments with the text, but um, I'll explain it. So he's quoting 32. He made the olive king over the air, bound it to a crown, and then he, this is his words, engraved at the beginning of the word, which is speech, back to the text, combined the letters with one another. Now, Donalo again. And he turned them into two words. He named the first olive mem shin, and the second olive shin men, mem. He then formed breath, ruach, out of his spirit, rucho, and with it, he formed the atmosphere in the universe, the moisture in the year, the torso in mankind, each one of them male and female. And then, um, the, back to the text again, the male with olive, mem, and shin, and the female with olive, shin, and mem. So Shabbatai is developing the Sefer, Yitzira, the Sefer Yitzira's ideas about language by supplying more detail. The elements of creation are themselves engraved in a word, which is speech. So the olive, the crown, and the air are themselves a form of pre-creative language. It takes on material form with the addition of divine breath. He formed breath, he literally physically formed breath, out of his spirit, and with it physically formed the atmosphere, moisture, torso, etc. Thus divine breath and divine letters constitute the substance of the universe, much as the soul does in Platonic and Neo-Platonic works. It is, as they say, turtles all the way down. This enriched melotheistic model precedes the introduction of the medical microcosm, and in this enriches it. So the medical microcosm is expressed as follows. Likewise, the belly of the man resembles the earth. Whenever he eats and drinks in regular measure and at the proper time, foods and beverages that are harmless to him, his head will be wholesome, sound, and in a state of well-being and good health. Just like Asaf's, this is standard issue Galenic medicine, but, to, but it's implicitly theorized differently on the basis of human participation in the divine via the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. In this case, the belly is associated with water, earth in the universe, cold in the year, and the fruit of the belly in mankind. That's um, Sefer Yitzhira 33. In isolation, we don't necessarily understand digestive health differently, and yet when the author asserts that the belly resembles the earth, we know why and how. In this way, Shabbatai enriches the melotheistic model of the Sefer Yitzhira with medical models from Asaf's work, and that is that of his contemporary Islamic authors, all of whom drew upon Galen's and Hippocrates' writings. For him, astrology is the basis of medical practice, as it was for his contemporary Muslim doctors. Finally, Shabbatai supports the theurgic function of the text. He argues in the first section of the work, the commentary on Genesis 126, that the purpose of human creation is the demonstration of divine glory, that, that this is the particular responsibility of the Jewish people who have accepted his laws. For him, the study of astrology demonstrates the glory of divine creation. Mm. It has an apotropaic function and in the end a theurgic one as well. To save time, I'm gonna skip the long quote. I'm just gonna tell you what he adds to the theurgy section. So to that section, Shabbatai adds some key words. Where the Sefer Yitzirat indicates a covenant with Abraham, Donalo specifies its transmission from generation to generation, including Isaac too. Where the text describes a covenant between the 10 toes of his feet, Donalo, Donalo adds, which is the covenant of circumcision? And where the text read, which is, reads, which is the covenant of the tongue, Donalo adds, which is the covenant of the holy tongue and the declaration of God's oneness. Thus astrology and theurgy become the exclusive domain of Jews using Hebrew, perhaps as a response to Muslim claims for the superiority of Arabic as a sign of divine favor. Thus Shabbatai Donalo retained and particularized the astrological and theurgic functions of the text. Now, to consider these four works together. Asaf's book exemplifies the presence of the same astrological models that informed the development of astrology in the medieval and Islamic Jewish worlds. 
he relies on Galen, Hippocrates, and um, Ptolemy for his medical astrology, aimed at showing divine glory in the world, a sort of miracle facilitated by knowledge of the relation between microcosm and macrocosm. It's also a conversionary tactic. tactic. The Sefer Yitzhira operates on the melothesic medical models, positing a direct association between body part and planet. The Sefer Yitzhira adds to it a theory of melothesia mediated by Hebrew letters, which are used to theorize the substantial relation between microcosm and macrocosm. Sadia, on the other hand, situates the astrological model of the Sefer Yitzhira in relation to the Kalam a philosophical school originating with Islam and critical of astrology at points as a threat to the conception of divine unity at the core of their system. Sadia then works to subsume the narrative of the Sefer Yetzirah within Genesis 1, asserting creation from nothing and by the divine voice. In this process, he renders theurgic action imaginable, imaginal, thereby delimiting the materiality of the letters and their power. Shabbatai's work theorizes the microcosmic relationship using a cosmopolitan model, much like Asaf's, but with the addition of Islamic astrology, which he says serves to elucidate the originally Jewish model. At the same time, he works to particularize the melothesia of the Sefer Yitzirah, um, drawing attention to the Hebrew language and situating its power in the covenant. Thus, in understanding the third theurgy of letter combination, um, in his understanding, the theurgy of letter combination acts upon a Judaized astrological model of the cosmos and its power and its power to act derives directly from the covenant. In this way, four Jewish texts express a variety of relationships to astrology, putting it to a number of di different uses. Two of these operate on pre-Islamic astrological models, while two explicitly consider and then Judaize Islamic models. In this way, Jews do to Islamic astrology what the Muslims did to that of the Greeks. Thank you very much, Marla, for this very clear and very interesting talk. And I am uh, happy to invite now our first respondent, Ms. Shandra Lamotte from the University of Chicago, from here, from the Divinity School. Uh, Chandra, in addition to being uh, one of the two organizers of this interesting conference, is also an MA student here at the Divinity School. And she is primarily interested in how the cultural translation and transmission of ideas about magic and divination is manifested in the textual and material cultures of the ancient Near East. And additionally, I can tell you that she does some magnificent work on Islamic amulets. Shanda, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Marla, for your wonderful presentation. I will format my response by highlighting some of the interesting points that I found throughout your presentation, which will be integrated with some queries that I came upon as I read your paper. Then, I will summarize by succinctly restating the most pertinent questions for our discussion. You began your paper by situating Jewish astrology with Arab astrology's theorization of the relationship between microcosm and microcosm, macrocosm. I feel that a strong point of this paper is that you create a parallel between these two cultures regarding how they strove to reconcile their place within the cosmos. The creation of this parallel, to me, is meant, to, is meant to set the framework of your paper as you go on to discuss the two pre-Islamic works and the two commentaries that were composed after the advent of Islam in light of their intercultural and intracultural discourse. I think you provide a wonderful overview of the basis of the pre-Islamic texts and how the 10th century commentaries resolve the context, contents of these texts based on their interpretations and, might I say, their religious, economic, and political, and political intentions and ideologies. This is not to say that the pre-Islamic texts did not have what, what seemed to be their own religious and political implications as well, which is something I will ask you to elaborate upon later. To be honest, your paper exposes a plethora of aspects that are multivalent, which warrant discussion and further study. But since I'm bound by time, I would like to focus this response to your discussion of the pre-Islamic texts, the Sefer Asaf. 
I am particularly drawn to this aspect of your paper for two reasons. First, it is not discussed as much as the Sefer Yetzirah, but at this point, I should also reiterate that within your paper, the texts engage with one another quite well, which of course can be understood from your methods of integration. Second, to me, the characteristics of the physician blur the lines between creator, human agent, and an embodiment of socio-political socio, socio power. You examine many intriguing elements within this text. You underscore the complexities associated with, and I say this in general terms, medicine, its practice, identity with regard to astrological knowledge, which may be understood, as you aptly explain, by a culture's absorption and combination of astrological discourse to formulate a model that works within their own traditions and boundaries as well as the theorization of macro and microcosm in conjunction with theurgic practice. What is striking to me, however, is the role that man plays in relation to the divine gift of healing or knowledge of medicine. The Sefer Asaf's focus on astrology as the basis of medical practice and, the, excuse me, the Sefer Asaf focuses on astrology as the basis of medical practice and interprets medicine as miracle with, with the physician as the as the acting agent. Based, upon, based on the example you provide, we have a situation where God has imparted knowledge to Noah by way of an intermediary, the angel Raphael. Then Noah, through what seems to be his own agency, disseminates this knowledge and it spreads to various lands, which in your paper, as I understand it, is going to be a cosmopolitan model of knowledge dissemination, which is then individually reabsorbed and redefined to conform into what I deem to be a cyclical process of producing cultural distinct models of understanding. Of note, however, when speaking of the culturally specific narrative model of medical knowledge as divine revelation, you mentioned that we, that we see, and I quote, the, met, the method of healing acted acting on a cosmopolitan model of astrology and its practice as redemption from sin to the figure of the doctor. Can you comment about the, the concept of medical practice or knowledge as a means of redemption of, from sin? I understand that this interpretation may be based upon the idea of the physician embodying a divine essence or power, and perhaps power here is the key term. Even then, how may it have been understood that this embodiment, coupled with the ability to heal, redeems man from sin? Your examination goes on to discuss healing as a perceived exercise, and I once again quote, uh, legitimate power as spectacle. The term spectacle for me bolsters the interpretation of man slash physician as divine healer into a political realm of healing as a form of proselytization. I totally mess up that word all the time. Sure. Which is of course, which of course also feeds into the economic discourse of knowledge that you highlight later in your paper. But returning to the Sefer Asaf, I am led to inquire about what I perceive to be a shift of creation or healing from a connection to God through the knowledge he imparted to the practitioner to healing as propaganda. From my understanding of your paper, within the astrological underpinnings of the Sefer Asaf, the human body is considered a microcosm that is composed of the same elements as the cosmos. And the medical knowledge to heal, perhaps even control, these human elements has been provided to the, to the virtuous physician who was chosen by God. Moreover, it is through his actions that one finds proof of divine glory. To me, what is powerful here is that this physician does not heal as an extension of creation. In this case, I am using knowledge as a bridge between man and the deity, but rather heals as an extension of power of persuasion or, conver of, or conversion. What I am trying to reconcile is how medicine, as proof of divine glory, coincides with, coincides with the legitimization of a person's power to convert others. Is this a direct decree from the deity? And how does human agency play into this? They seem, they seem like they can be on the same plane, but to me, they can also be very different philosophical concepts as well. Can you perhaps help me better understand this political undercurrent in the terms of this particular manuscript? In short, the queries that I pose about the concept of medical practice or knowledge as a means of redemption from sins, as well as the representation of divine glory in juxtaposition with, legitim with legitimacy and power are actually quite closely intertwined. Additionally, both of these points are situated 
under the overarching question of the role, if any, that human agency plays. Yeah. Good summary. I wish I said that. <laughs> um, I want to begin answering your questions with a warning. Are you ready? So, I don't know how many of you know Michael Swartz, but he works on text, he works on Jewish magic of this period. And when I told him recently that I was really interested in Asaf, he said to me, be careful. He said, no one has ever completed a work on Asaf. And if you try, you will go mad. <laughs> so I think you should just stop right now. <laughs> I'm already crazy. No. Um, so, so, you know, the, you brought up a really interesting point, and part of one of the ways that I can answer your question about human agency and healing has to do with part of the paper that I cut out. Okay, um, so I'm really interested in the introduction of, to the work, and that is the genealogy of the text. And in that genealogy of the text, it's called a book of Noah. Okay, and so the, there's a story of you know I, I told you part of that story. But the setting of that story is just after the flood. So what happens just after the flood in that story is that Noah's children begin be behaving waywardly. They begin sinning. And as a result, they begin to suffer from ailments, from really horrible ailments. And so his whole family goes into mourning, and they fast, and they pray, and they say invocations. And what happens then is that God appears to them and tells Noah that he will have medical knowledge imparted to him by, you know, by angels. So what happens then is that the angel comes and he gives the knowledge to Noah, but the angel gets the knowledge from the demons. <laughs> yeah, that's what's, that's what's really interesting. So the angel gets the knowledge from the demons because the demons are actually the ones who are in charge of administering Ill, you know, punishment through illness, okay? And so as part of that um, ritual, nine-tenths of the demons are decommissioned, but one-tenth are allowed to remain in order to punish those people who truly deserve it, okay? Who responds to those people who truly deserve it? Doctors do, okay? And so because human beings are punished for sin by illness, the doctors then take on the role of God in alleviating that suffering. So, the, I mean, it's a very situational answer. And I think you asked other questions about the political setting of, of the work. And those are really interesting questions. Um, when, see, it's clear there are no Asaf scholars have actually survived to debate me um, when I said that it was, <laughs> no, when I said that it was said in the sixth century because there's no agreement on that at all none right but um, what I've done in in previous work is I've reconstructed um, you know there are descriptions of the four directions in the work and I've reconstructed um, I put them on a map, so, they, so two of the four directions are associated with places. One is Yemen and the other is Galilee. And so if you, and so if you, and Yemen's the south and Galilee's the west. And if you, if you actually put that on a map, you can see that he's probably talking about the southwest corner of Persia, okay? And so then the question is, when was there a medical school in the southwest corner of Persia? And nobody agrees on that either, right? But there was one at Jundashapur. Oh, actually, you're the one who would be able to answer this question. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it seems to me it's sixth century Jindashapur, and it seems to me also most people remarked that he shows no knowledge of any Talmudic um, ideas about medicine, or if he does have knowledge of them, he doesn't bother to include them or refute them. Okay. So, and the fact that it's written in lecture form. And the fact that it's written down probably by one of his, what it seems like one of his disciples, really suggests a university setting. And it also suggests a cosmopolitan university setting where these traditions that he's referring to are actually being taught. So that's what I can say about the social situation. But, you know, anyone could say I was wrong and they would have as much authority as I did. <laughs> so, so, so th did I get your questions or was there still another? Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. 
we thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.